all right, well, welcome yet again to another lovely session of Triple Engineering with Funny J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Funny J. Laird. In this video, we're going to be working through an example uh, of lab design, in particular looking at the design and analysis of a one-way reinforced concrete slab that is uh, simply supported. And in a follow-up video, we'll have one where we work with the ACI MOMA coefficient for a uh, continuous slab. Okay. So here's our problem. We have a slab that supports a uh, supports the following loads. Design the one-way slab so that it's supported to carry these loads. Consider moment of shear and code prescriptive requirements, but do not consider the fact. Okay, so the first step is going to be to have to do a few load combinations to get our ultimate distributed load. So I can title this maybe, oh, let's see. Load factory. So we'll have our dead load, or distributed dead loads, I suppose. And then we'll have distributed live load. So I'm going to call this WD, and that will be uh, 200. Uh, now, the actual load is an area load. If you look at these values, these are pounds per square foot, which means these are area loads. These are loads per unit area. However, as we've discussed, when we design reinforced concrete slabs, we're going to design them as one foot wide beams, as unit beams. So I can just go ahead and instead of using 200 pounds per square foot, I can just treat this immediately as a beam with a load of 200 pounds per foot. And in the, in the system of uh, as math, we use uh, pound force instead of just pounds. Okay, pounds per foot, and also the live load. 300 pound force per foot. Okay. Then uh, I want to I want to go ahead and do some fact some load combinations or factoring. And because this we only have dead load and live load, either the ASCE uh, load combination one or ASC load combination two will govern. So our first load combination we have, uh, I'll call this W1 equals, that would just be 1.4 times W dead. And we want this in of course per foot. And load combination two. I'll just call this W2. 1.2 W dead, 1.2 times dead load plus 1.6 times live load. And this of course will be in time force per foot as well. So clearly, we're gonna have what's going to control will be the uh, load combination two, and that's not surprising because we have only dead load and live load present, and our live load is larger than our dead load. Okay, so we now have our uh, factored load, and I'll just go ahead and call this W, the chosen load combination, or maybe the controlling load combination. And I'll just go ahead and call this W, or maybe WU for ultimate distributed load. And again, that is equal to that, but in front force per foot. Okay, so we now have this. Now I'll go ahead and uh, calculate my maximum shear and maximum moment that I need to design this for. Uh, design moment. That will be, well, it's a simply supported uh, element, or again, since we're designing this as a one foot wide beam, this is, uh, we can design this as a simply supported one foot wide beam, and so our maximum moment will just be WL squared over H. Oh, and we do also need the length. So maybe I'll just cut, create another section here called uh, shear and length calculation. Our beam length and I'll just go ahead and call this L 
And we do want to be very careful to distinguish L from LM. Uh, when we look at the continuous example, the continuous uh, slab examples uh, in the next video, we'll see that we use L sub N, and that is the uh, that is the free span of the slab. So in other words, uh, the length is from the center of one support to the center of the other support. Well, and that, that would just be L, while LN would be the uh, length from the center of one support to the center of the other support, but subtracting out the actual dimensions. So in other words, it's the face-to-face, -face, LN is the face-to-face -face, uh, span of the slab here. But for our moment, we can just go ahead and use the actual center to center length. Now, a good argument probably could, made, could be made that we could get away with using L sub n, but to be conservative, I'll just go ahead and use uh, L. So that is just an E. And then design, actually, I'll go ahead and get design shear first, because that, that just feels a little better. And I'm going to call this V ultimate. And because this is a simply supported beam, that's just going to be WL over T. Oh, W ultimate. And I'm going to report this in text. 5.4K. All right, so next let's get our design moment. Our design moment is going to be, let's see. Well, our design moment will be, uh, again, WL squared over 8, so that's WU, times L squared, divided by 8. And that will be not joules, but in kip feet. So 20.25 kip feet. So ultimately, we need to do is we need to design a reinforced concrete slab that will carry a shear of 5.4 kips and a design moment of 20.25 uh, kips. And again, note, uh, these values are for a one foot wide strip of the slab. All right, so continuing on, I want to go look at some of our code checks. Now we now we are designing this, so we do need to know something about the uh, materials. And this wasn't given in the problem statement, so, just, so I will just assume that we can specify our values. And so let's specify a well, let's see, maybe a uh, twenty-eight day compressive strength. An F prime C equal to, say, 4,000, or maybe 4,500 psi. So we'll have a 28-day a compressive stress of 4,500 psi, and let's just go ahead and use uh, the yield strength of steel. Now, these could have been given in the problem, but uh, oh, we can just specify them if they're not given. F yield, let's just say that's 60 psi. Okay, so we have that. Okay, so uh, we need somewhere. So the, the tricky part about this uh, problem is that we're not actually analyzing a, a slab. In other words, the slab design itself doesn't exist. We are designing a slab. We're not given a detail for a slab and just told and said and told to uh, determine what what its maximum capacity is. Instead, we have to start with a blank page and determine a uh, uh, some well, all the parameters, including the thickness, including the um, oh, let's say including the steel both in, in both directions, the primary structural steel in the strong direction, and then the shrinkage and temperature steel in the minor direction. Okay, so we do need a starting point, and to do this, let's go ahead and say okay. Well, um, we need a starting point. So we need a starting point to figure out, uh, again, just like we've looked at with beams, we can't find the moment capacity of something unless we, at, at a bare minimum, know its depth. So let's go ahead and we need some sort of starting point. And if we have no other information, uh, I say a good starting point is probably just to start at the minimum uh, slab thickness. 
Now, if you look at table 7.3.1.1, uh, there you will find minimum slab thicknesses for uh, various runway slabs. And we have a simply supported slab. And the minimum slab thickness, again, this is a slab thickness that, regardless of what the mechanics say, we are not allowed to go uh, less than this. So let's just start with that and use that as a starting point. And if we need to make it thicker, we will make it thicker. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, this is ATI table 7.3.1.1. So uh, we do have a simply supported slab. And always good to annotate. So I'll say it's a simply supported slab. And let's just say H equals L over 20. And I will convert this to, I'll report this in inches. So our minimum slab thickness is going to be nine inches. Uh, next, I'd like to look at uh, cover depth. So let's look at uh, cover requirements. Table 20.5 point, uh, 20.5 point, uh, let's say, what is that? 20.5 point, 1.3.1. And this is ACI table uh, 20.5.1.3.1. Let's go ahead and go there. ACI and 20.5.3.1.1. Oh, sorry, 0.1.3.1. Aren't ACI citations lovely? Okay, so uh, concrete exposure cast against permanently in place in contact, cast against and permanently in contact with ground. No, we don't have that. Um, exposed to seawater. No. Uh, permanently in contact with ground. No. Uh, and not not with any kind. Uh, not any kind of uh, ground contact or seawater contact. So we don't have a uh, a specific uh, cover requirement from that. So instead, we'll go to this here. Oh, sorry, that was actually just, I was looking at the wrong table. We gotta be looking at 25.1 uh, point, that, point, point, uh, five point, uh, one point three point one. Helps if we look at the right table. Okay, so not, ex so we, uh, this is not a foundation slab, at least it wasn't, it, that wasn't given to us. Uh, we're designing this as a freely supported slab, or just a free-hanging slab that is simply supported at its end. So it is reasonable to assume, unless we've been told otherwise, that this is not uh, exposed to the weather. So there's going to be, this is either a, uh, you can say like a first-story slab on a, a floor slab inside a building, or, or some sort of roof slab that is protected from the elements. So our um, minimum cover depth, now, Depending on what cover we use, or on what kind of, um, depending on what kind of bars we use, we'll have different cover requirements. So we could do different things, but uh, if we use smaller bars, we'll, we'll only need this three quarter inch requirement. But if we use larger bars, we do, we'll use the one and a half inch. Now, since we already have this piece, uh, relatively thick, uh, nine inch thick slab requirement, I think we can just go ahead and use the. Uh, I think we can just go ahead and use the one and a half inch requirement. That way, if we do need to, if we uh, find we don't need the one and a half, uh, the, if we, if we find we need something greater than a number 11 bar, then we'll still be fine using uh, that one and a half inch uh, requirement. And it never hurts to go a little bit more cover than you need. But we could probably get away with the uh, three quarter inch requirement. In fact, I'll go ahead and note that here. As the seal is probably going to be number 11 or less. Uh, yes, here again. Uh, yeah, 
So yeah, a number 11 and smaller. So steel will probably be number 11 or smaller. So, um, but to you conservatives, let's use a cover depth of one and a half inches. Now, um, so the tricky thing about this is that we need to determine our, um, we need to determine our uh, reinforcing, but we won't know the exact depth until we actually get our, um, we don't know the exact depth until we actually get a, um, our bar size. Because again, depth D comes down to, uh, the depth D of a, uh, of a beam uh, comes down to exactly where the center line of the uh, bar is, but we're not going to be able to do that with a, um, we're not going to be able to know the exact value until we go and actually select the bar size. So um, we have a couple approaches. We could iterate on a bar size, or another option we could do is we could actually choose a fixed distance that would work for most any bar size, and then um, simply have less or more cover depending on what bar size, final bar size we select for our uh, primary steel. So I say, let's go ahead and do that. So what I mean by this is, okay, let me just pull up paint my picture. So we are going to have a slab. And there's going to be some bars in it. Depending on what size the mass is we require, that's the one we'll end up using. And also, we can adjust the spacing, not only the bar size. Now, the tricky thing about this is that uh, we're going to go with this one and a half minimum cover depth. But what we need to know is D. To design the to, to do our moment calculations, what we really need to know is D here. But with a fixed cover depth uh, here. Again, if we have a fixed cover depth, depending on what uh, our bar size, and that's the diameter, and that's the radius of the bar we use, we'll end up with a slightly different uh, depth D. So what I might do is I might choose a uh, a distance, I might choose a conservative value that regardless what bar size I choose, I'm probably going to be covered. So for example, what I might do is, what if I said, uh, if we look at, um, so for example, let's pull up a, uh, if we look at our standard bar sizes, let's find that table here. This is just one trick you can use to uh, speed along the process of uh, iteration. Actually, I might just keep on this uh, online quickly. Okay. So uh, standard D bar sizes. So we have our standard bar sizes and the largest bar size, well, we're never going to really be using 18. That's pretty much not going to happen. So what we could do is our, uh, for example, our number, uh, our number 14 bar, which is the largest we would ever use, and even that would be pretty excessive, uh, has a diameter of 1.693 inches. So if we, if we wanted to avoid some iteration, one trick we could do, at least initially, is we could just assume the smallest or the largest bar size and just accept that if we're going to use a smaller bar size, we can just have uh, more cover more cover depth than we would otherwise have. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Maybe I'll say that there is a, um, uh, you know what, I'll, I could be very conservative and say round this up to one, this 1 1.693. I could be very conservative and round that up to one and three quarters. So if we look at, to do some quick math, well, one and three quarter inches Say, uh, well, one and three quarter inches, that is, okay, so we have eight quarters for the one, 11 quarters for the two. 
uh, so like eight, eleven, there's eleven and three quarters. Yeah, so that would be uh, one and three quarters. Yes, that would be eight quarters plus three, so eleven quarters effectively. So divide that by two to get the radius, and we would have eleven sixteenths. So in other words, we're assuming a bar radius of uh, eleven sixteenths. So uh, to avoid iterating. Say to avoid iterate on bar depth can assume a certain depth that uh, will accommodate any bar size, but with, with, with that will require that will accommodate almost any bar size except that number eighteen bar. Uh, and then uh, this will this will fix uh, beam depth. Uh, fix the beam depth at a known value, but uh, simply adjust cover depth as needed. So, in other words, I'm just going to assume that uh, our bar diameter is one and three quarter inches. Even though I know that there is no way that's going to be true, because there actually are no bar sizes that are one and three quarter inches, I just want to use a nice round number, and I can then just specify my uh, I can then just specify my uh, drawing, at least my draw my simple drawing here, as from the base to the center line. So if this is one and three quarter inches, and again we can adjust that based on. Um, uh, simply based on uh, what our uh, bar sizes are, our final bar sizes are, and we'll just end up with different covers here. And so if I have this, that again is uh, that is 11 uh, fourths, and then that would be 11 sixteenths. So um, 1.5 plus 11 sixteenths. Let's see. So this is 5. Yeah. So this would be uh, and actually, so I'm getting from the center line to the uh, bottom surface of the uh, slab. Then, with that, with this method I'm using, that would be uh, that would be let's see, that would be two and three sixteenths. Although I don't necessarily like using uh, sixteenths, so maybe I'll just go ahead and say uh, three sixteenths is really close to a quarter. So maybe I'll just go ahead and say that is two and one quarter inches. And again, I'm only, if you don't necessarily need to do this, this is just my one way, one, there, are, there are many ways you can do these, but this is just one method you can use that will also allow you to uh, minimize the number of things you need to iterate, which is very useful when you're starting with a blank page and uh, trying to design a beam, uh, design a beam, or in this case a slab, uh, from a blank page. Okay, so I'm going to assume this distance here from again is two and a quarter inches, and again because we're required to have that relatively thick nine-inch thick slab, uh, we should have plenty of room, I think. But we will need to check that. So, um, for cover, uh, let's go. The minimum cover is is one and one half inch. Again, and even that's being conservative, but you never go wrong. Uh, you can never go wrong having uh, more cover than is required. Well, within reason, of course. Um, and assuming a distance from the center of steel of uh, a flexural steel. Again, that is the steel that's actually carrying moment to the uh, outer surface. Of the slab, uh, and uh, two and one quarter inches will accommodate even the largest of uh, the largest of bar sizes, uh, except the number eighteen, which you almost never use, them, except in some really, really exotic project, uh, products or projects. So with that, we can uh, with that assumption, we can we can then go and calculate our beam depth. Uh, 
Uh, let's say D equals, um, let's see. Uh, then we can say that our beam depth B will simply be H minus uh, 2.25 inches. And that will then, of course, be simply 6.75 inches. Okay. So we can get, we, we'll look at the, I'll, I want to look at the shrinkage and temperature seal a bit later. But for now, we need to go and calculate our, um, I want to focus on our uh, primary flexural seal first. Actually, something I should do before even that is, um, since I'm going to be relying on our, um, so I'm going to be relying on our, uh, 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 since we rely on just our concrete to carry our shear, we need to go and uh, find our, uh, we need to go and, I, I want to go and calculate our, um, our shear capacity. And doing this, this, gonna, this is probably going to be a trick, uh, just a quick check. Shear doesn't usually control, but let's go ahead and check that because if our is because this is ultimately going to be determined by our beam uh, by our slab depth, and uh, this is another uh, check you can use to make sure you're within a reasonable value of that of the depth or the other required depth uh, for your uh, slab. Okay, let's go ahead and check shear. Now. One thing we do need to do is to find our, uh, we do need to find our, uh, not factors of safety, but our resistance factors for our, uh, for our uh, shear. Let's go ahead and find that. And that be a key value. Okay, so for shear, we're going to use a C value of 0 0.75. And there are other requirements for seismic, but we're ignored it. We're not dealing with seismic in this example. So our resistance factor, and that's again, that's ACI uh, table 21.2.1. We'll check that, 21.2.1, yep. Uh, so maybe I'll use a, uh, let's call that PV. Uh, PV, V shear, is going to be equal to 0 0.75. Now, as we discussed in class, we need a, uh, we're not going to rely on, uh, well, with a uh, slab, we don't have shear stirrup, we don't have stirrup providing shear reinforcement, so all of the shear capacity needs to come from the concrete itself. And uh, that is going to be determined by equation 22.5.5.1. Let's go down here, or section, or that section. 22.5.5.1. Uh, and this, now, uh, we in class, we looked at a simplified version of this, which is just 2 times lambda times root f times c. So if we look at this NU, this is a uh, slightly different variation of that. Now, if we look at NU, NU deals with axial load, and that's if you have axial load present in your uh, slab, uh, if you're dealing with a combination of uh, shear and axial load, especially if you, have a, if you have a beam column or something like that. Now, this is not going to be the case here. We don't have to worry about this. This oh, We just have a simple slab that is not doesn't have any kind of axial load compressing it, so we don't need to worry about this NU over uh, 6 AG term. So uh, we can say uh, the shear capacity. Now uh, our lambda value, lambda is a factor for uh, lightweight concrete. Uh, it wasn't stated anywhere on the, in the problem statement. So uh, again, that's the lightweight concrete factor. And if nothing else is stated, I'll just go ahead and assume normal white concrete, uh, which would have a lambda equal to one. Now, uh, if we look at that equation again, we need F times C, which we have. BW is the width of the beam, and D is the beam depth. We've already calculated beam depth. Again, we could have assumed a uh, conservative value for our uh, distance or of a bar rate, or basically our bar diameter, uh, that will accommodate almost any bar size. 
So uh, now we need to get our uh, theme width, but we are dealing again, when we analyze a slab or design a slab, we typically design it in a unit width, or in this case, a one foot wide width. So our beam width, our beam width, even though we really have a slab here, or just one uh, width of unit slab, And we're going to have BW, that's just going to equal one foot or 12 inches. So then, oh, uh, let's see. Here. Now, we do need to be very careful with this and that there is a, uh, there is a, uh, there is a requirement here. There is a notation here. Um, with AB greater than or equal to AV min. Let's take a look at this. AV min. Uh, for beams and one-way slabs defined in 9.6.3.4. Let's take a look at that. So looking here at the reference uh, 9.6.3.4, uh, this gives an previous table is based on a minimum shear area, but that's only if shear reinforcement is required, which it typically wouldn't be for a uh, reinforced concrete one-way slab. So uh, let's go up here and look at uh, conditions where shear reinforcement is not required, where AV min is not required. The first one is if BU is greater than uh, P, uh, or P times lambda times root F times C, times BW times B. Let's go ahead and try to calculate that. So um, determine if, if shear reinforcement is required. And I'm gonna go ahead and run through this, although typically for a slab, you wouldn't bother running through this. This is uh, more for your edification and something we'll look at more when we get to a beam shear design. So uh, we want to say, we determine, and this is going to be 9.6.3.1. And let's see. So let's just do an explicit comparison. Uh, v sub u is equal to 5.4 tips. And here, let's on the other side compare it to P, uh, and I'll go ahead and use PV for shear, uh, times lambda, which is just, again, just one in our case, if we have normal light concrete, times square root of F prime C. Now, in this, uh, SMS like MathCAD speak units, so uh, I'm using a, this system, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and divide by PSI to cancel out the units because again, uh, the root F prime C equation is a empirical equation uh, and it's not meant to have, it's not meant to transfer units through it. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And we do, just to make the units work, we will need a tips or pounds out there. Although actually that would be in pounds, I believe. Uh, so F prime C, that's going to be just F prime C, divided by PSI, and we will need a pound force here, that's N, uh, times BW times C, and this would be pound force. And it wants to actually let's look and see why it is speed this. Nope, see that's gonna be in meters squared. We can't have that just uh, here. And so actually what we need is just a uh, maybe just a divide by PSI. To make the units work, uh, divide by PSI here, and then uh, multiply by PSI here.
And so this is handled uh, very similarly to how do we handle, uh, say, the elastic modulus in this. Uh, it's going to be in PSI. So these equations are set up uh, to work with PSI. So, uh-oh. Uh, we don't have that decimal places. Create that thing. We'll just say two decimal places. So, uh, again, this F prime C B W D. That's just meant to make the units work. So you need to multiply by uh, you need to multiply by uh, PSI to make the units work, and then divide by PSI inside the root. Or again, you can just treat this as um, uh, you can just treat this as uh, if you're using F prime C, it will give a unit in um, appropriate unit in pounds. In other words, if you just throw PSI into this equation it will output a value in pounds. Okay. Now we do have, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing that F prime uh, VU would actually be required here. Because notice it states that uh, VU greater than P uh, lambda squared of F prime C B W D. And in this case, A, uh, a V min would be, would be required. However, if we look here, as long as we keep our uh, slab thickness, in other words, a shallow depth beam, as long as we keep it less than or equal to 10 inches, we will not need shear reinforcement, which would be good because it's typically hard to fit shear reinforcement inside a reinforced concrete slab. So again, we can look here and say, for a shallow depth beam, or in this case, a slab, uh, H, if, we're, if we stick with that nine inches, H is less than nine inches, or uh, well, H equals 10 inches, or nine inches, I should say. Maybe I'll write this out like this, which is less than or equal to 10 inches. Therefore, the AV min, the minimum shear, reinforce, shear area reinforcement, does not apply. So our AV min is zero, is basically zero. Now, the reason, again, for reviewing this, the whole reason we did this was just to be very thorough in our code check. And if we go back to 22.5.5.1, uh, uh, Go back to 20, uh, 22.5.5.1. Okay. Uh, we have we can use this requirement if our AV, if our shear area is greater than or equal to AV min. We do not have shear spirits, we don't have shear reinforcement because this is a slab rather than a beam. And so, but if our AV min is zero then um, we will meet that requirement automatically. So therefore, AV min is zero. Uh, therefore, can use, uh, therefore, have AV greater than or equal to uh, AV min. AV, again, referring to shear stirrups, uh, but again, you only see that, you typically only see that in beams unless you had some sort of very thick concrete slab. Okay, so uh, we've confirmed now that we can use this equation for our uh, for our uh, concrete shear capacity. And again, this will be ACI 22.5.5.1. ACI table 22.5.5.1. And that's going to be uh, 2 lambda times root f prime c. And again, this nu over 6 ag isn't going to matter because we don't have any axial force present in our beam or in our slab, which is a beam, basically. Okay, so if we see, 
And again, this is the sheer capacity of the concrete alone without considering any additional sheer capacity from steel. Two times lambda, which again is just one for normal weight concrete, uh, times square root of f prime c. Now, if I see units work, we need to multiply by pi psi out front. times the square root of f prime c. Because again, these equations, anything with this root f prime c, is intended just to be, uh, you, if you input a units of pounds per square inch, you will output, uh, on the back end, you will get a, a unit in pounds. Okay, final force value in pounds. So f prime dot c. But, uh, so if you just throw your numbers into a calculator, keeping everything psi in pounds, then you'll get a nice round value and it'll work well. But if you're using a program like SMAP that speaks units and actually tracks the units, you have to use little tricks like uh, dividing by PSI and multiplying by PSI. Uh, times PW times C. And we get a value of 10.9 pips. And then uh, our Z, uh, since we don't have any shear reinforcement, our, our shear capacity is just going to be equal to our V feet. Here, just for feet. And that makes pips. So we have a nominal shear capacity of 10.87 pips. Then we need to find our design shear capacity. So I just want to write it this. Nominal shear capacity of 10.87 uh, pips and a design shear capacity, which is BVN, or B times B in this case. Uh, uh, actually, we have BZ, sorry. Uh, if you see it, this is B. And then decimal place two, and we want this in units of six. So our V ultimate, our V ultimate is 5.4 pips. Again, that is sort of, that is our demand, our shear demand. And this is in fact less than our uh, design shear capacity. And so we, so our slab using just the shear capacity of the concrete will be adequate. And that's always a good check just to make sure that your, um, that your beam depth is reasonable. So or that your slab depth is reasonable. So the tricky thing again about slabs and shear is that you can't increase your shear capacity uh, by just adding shear reinforcement. So if our only way is to, so effectively our only way to uh, resist uh, shear is to have a thick enough slab. And so uh, if we don't have a thick enough slab, then we need to make it thicker because we can't have any kind of shear reinforcement in a typical reinforced concrete one-way slab or even two-way slab. Okay, we've gone ahead and uh, found our, confirmed that our shear capacity is good. Now we need, I want to uh, next uh, calculate moment capacity. And this is the moment capacity of again, uh, one foot wide section or design moment capacity. Now uh, let's go back and look at uh, key values again. And that is ACI table 21.2.1. And moment axial force, okay, so depending on, uh, just as we've seen previously, depending on what our, uh, we'll have a fee value depending on our epsilon, we can't necessarily get that yet, like, we, we can't necessarily get that immediately, like we did with our, um, like we did with our uh, uh, shear uh, uh, resistance factor. Okay, so assuming that the steel yields, let's go back and review a bit of team theory. Go ahead and label that as a new section, it's not underlined. 
So uh, assuming this uh, calculates the steel tension force, assuming that the steel has yielded. Well, we're going to have a slight problem. And that problem is that our, we don't know our area of steel. We don't yet know an area of steel. So instead, what we can do is we can just guess an area of steel and then iterate along that until we get a certain required area of steel. And this would be the area of steel per foot of slab. So let's guess we have, oh, I don't know. Um, what if we have an area of steel of two square inches? And we'll just iterate until we get the minimum area of steel in our um, uh, in our one foot beam section, or one foot our one foot wide bottle beam, which again is a one foot wide section or a unit width of our reinforced concrete slab. And so I'm just going to guess, oh, let's see, AS, maybe this is equal to, oh, I don't know, two inches squared. And this may be too much, this may be way too much, this may be way too little. We'll just iterate until we find out. Okay, so area of steel, then um, keep our tension force. Again, assuming that the steel has yielded. And this is going to be AS times FY. And we will have that 120 pips. This is probably going to end up being way more steel than we need, although we shall find out. We, the thing is, we do have a very small moment arm in our slab. So next, let's look at our, um, our beta value. So I believe that was chapter, let's find our beta values. I still need to tab this in my manual here. Let's get better at tabbing on manual. My older editions are all nice and tabbed, but my uh, newer edition needs some uh, tabs in it. So, let's see. at our Whitney Stress Block. So if you want to find out where that is, we can go to our uh, Whitney Stress Block section. Oh, or what? Ah, this is what I was looking for. 22.2.2.4.3. Uh, Pulling it up here, the beta values, our beta 1 values specifically. Uh, 22.2. 22.2.2.4.3. Here are our beta values. Uh, for 2500 to 4000 PSI, beta 1 is 0.85. Uh, we ha again have an F prime C of, uh, let's see, we have an F prime C of 4500. So we're going to be in that middle zone. Uh, beta 1 value. And again, beta 1 is going to be the ratio between, um, it will be the ratio between our neutral axis depth and our uh, Whitney stress block depth. Uh, so let's see, beta 1 equals, again, but, and also I'll just go ahead and note this is, this is for the case of uh, 4,000 is less than F times C is less than 8,000 PSI. And this is ACI table 22.2.2.4.3. Beta 1 will be equal to 0 0.85. Again, this is just a linear interpolation between the two. 
uh, between our um, linear interpolation between the uh, 0.65 and the 0.85 values. Uh, so that's 0.05 times f prime dot c. And I'll go ahead and just divide by psi because this is another one of those lovely uh, empirical equations. Well, not really empirical, just doesn't have units, isn't really written with units in mind. And that's divided by 1000. That looks about right. We have a beta 1 value of 0.825. Although, uh, what we really, as so that will be useful in calculating our, or determining our uh, steel uh, strain to, to confirm that it has yielded. However, what we really need is an area of the Whitney stress block required to balance out this 120 steps. Uh, steel uh, yielding force. And we could call this different things. Um, I'll just go ahead and it, it doesn't have a certain, like this area, this method of first calculating the area, I find this very useful for talk for a sort of uh, envisioning or following along or teaching the process, but it doesn't have a specific variable in the, uh, in the uh, uh, ACI manual. So instead maybe I'll just leave it as a uh, quotient rather than a fixed value. Okay, so that area, is going to be, uh, and remember, the whole idea of practical design in, in within the ACI system is that we're going to have a uh, a stress of 0.85, uh, 0.85 times f prime c over the entire area of the Whitney stress block. So the area of the Whitney stress block for our one foot wide uh, beam. It's just going to be t divided by 0 0.85 times f prime dot c. And in inches squared, 31.37 inches squared. And that corresponds to a Whitney stress block depth of, let's see, a. That is simply going to be this divided by A, or divided by the beam width. So A equals this whole thing. Do that properly. All of this divided by our beam width, which is that one foot. And we get a very small number, or in, if I convert to inches, of 2.64 inches. Now, based on that, I can then go and calculate my, uh, I can then go and calculate my, um, my uh, neutral axis depth using my beta value. Our neutral axis depth then, C will be equal to A divided by beta one. And that many inches. So let's go back to paint and do a little bit of review of strain diagrams. So we're going to have we have a depth D, which we've already calculated uh, here. Based on our assumed value, we chose something that would make it, make it so we didn't have to iterate along the depth of 6.75 inches. So that means that this depth here, so this that our dimension from here to here, is 6.75 inches. And C, the neutral axis depth, C is equal to that, uh, what we just got, which was 3.17 inches. And then this dimension here, 
and then we have two octopus at the bottom of the centroid of the steel. This is six points. So this is basically B minus C. So if I want, so and then uh, in terms of strain, so we assume a uh, concrete crushing strain of 0 0.003, and then we have steel, uh, our strain in our steel, so epsilon s basically. So, and if we look at this, we can apply similar triangles and say that epsilon s over d minus c is equal to uh, 0 0.003 over 3.17, or simply the strain in our steel. Epsilon s, epsilon s then is equal to, uh, that's going to be equal to, let's see, that will be, again, um, looking at the similar triangles here, it will simply, because again, I can say that, uh, I'm just sort of writing this out to get this uh, straight, over d minus c, is equal to 0 0.03 over C. So I can then just say epsilon S equals 0 0.03 over C times D minus C. Uh, let's see, over C. Times D minus C. And that comes to 0 0.00339 which doesn't necessarily look very large. So uh, moving along, I need to check if our steel has yielded. So print something here, yeah. So I want to go ahead and calculate the yield strain of my steel. And that will be epsilon y. And that's just going to be equal to the yield stress divided by the elastic modulus of steel, which of course is 29,000 psi. So I can just say that's Fy divided by 29,000 psi. And that is 0.002. So actually, oh, 0.0027. So it turns out that our steel actually has, in fact, yielded. Epsilon s is equal to, uh, or actually, let's just write this out explicitly, uh, which is, in fact, greater than our epsilon yield. So our assumption is actually true. Let's just write this out explicitly. So yes, the steel has yielded. So our steel has yielded. Uh, next, we want to go and so with that uh, determined, I want to next determine my um, moment arm length, which is our JD value. JD is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that will be equal to B minus AO2, the distance to the bottom of the, the centroid of the steel, minus one half the depth of the Witten stretch block. And that's in meters or in inches. And that is way too many decimal places. That's probably still too many, but that's fine. We can then get our nominal moment capacity. So our MN, this is going to simply be T times JD, and we don't want it in joules, we want it in, uh, let's see, what did we report our previous maximum, our maximum acceleration in? Uh, we did that, let's see, in feet, so I'll do the same. 54.4 feet. And our, now I want to get our phi uh, mn, our phi then, so our phi value, or our resistance factor, so 
we need to figure out if we're uh, compression controlled transition or uh, or uh, compression controlled. And again, this will, and, and this will be in uh, ACI table 21.2.2. Here, we're dealing with uh, for moment axial force or combined moment and axial force. And we need to compare our uh, the strain in our tension reinforcement to the strain in uh, to the yield strain of that. So uh, our epsilon s, or as this table says, epsilon t, epsilon s is this, and uh, epsilon yield, the yield strain of this yield, plus 0.003 is this. So we are actually, uh, we are greater than the yield strain, but we're not greater than 0.003 times yield strain. So therefore, we have to do the interpolation for our, uh, we have to do that middle uh, transition region uh, or the interpolation region uh, for our uh, P factor. So we're, again, we are greater than, uh, we are greater than our yield strain. But we are not greater than, 0 .00, than, than the yield strain plus 0 0.003. So again, looking at this, uh, we are greater than our yield strain. This doesn't, so we're not compression controlled, but we're not tension controlled either. So therefore, our uh, C in that, tra in that transition region, I'm going to call this Vm because we have two different P values we were considering today, uh, 0 0.65 plus 0 0.25 times epsilon t minus epsilon t y or as we be as we've labeled them here epsilon s minus epsilon y uh, divided by 0 0.03 or 0.76 here so uh, then we can get our c uh, PM, uh, basically our PMN, our design moment capacity, and that will be, uh, let's say, PM times MN, and definitely don't want, we definitely don't want this in joules, so we want this in bit feet. And let's compare this to the maximum uh, moment. So we are substantially larger than our design moment. And that, again, is using, um, that is using a very conservative cover depth. So I don't think we're going to have any problem with our uh, moment capacity, although, um, when we got shear, we determined that our shear capacity was substantially larger than our demand. I didn't go and try to adjust the depth of the slab or anything based on that. And the reason I, and one, I didn't do that for two reasons. One, I knew that we were already, we were already using our minimum slab thickness. And two, um, typically shear will not control. So I don't typically adjust, start adjusting things, at least right away, just based on shear. However, uh, with this moment, this is kind of a clue that, see, I have nearly twice as much moment capacity as I need. So that shows that I can probably get away with much less steel than, um, much less steel than I uh, would otherwise, than, than what I assumed. So if we can go back up here and use, uh, you know, I have approximately twice the amount of steel, uh, twice the amount of moment capacity that I need. So what if just, uh, I don't know, uh, what if just, uh, in, I could I could just naively guess, what if I just cut the area of steel in half? So I'm just going to iterate on this. I just copied this entire section. So I just copy the original. So what happens if I say area of steel is one inch? So then my oh, new step block depth will change. My neutral axis depth will change. Um, Let's see. Now uh, where steel still has yielded, so we're not going to have any problem there. Uh, however, let's look at this. Our 
Now, here we are actually, uh, by reducing that area of steel, we make our steel yield sooner. And so we end up with a much more entrenchable detection. Uh, here now, epsilon s is actually uh, greater than um, uh, epsilon y plus 0.03. So that means that our t value is going to be equal to 0 0.9 for a tension control detection. Go ahead and do that iteration. And to me, that looks a lot more reasonable. So I think we should aim, we might even be able to get away with a little less. Um, what if it was 0.75? Let's see if it was, uh, let me copy this. Let's just see how low we can go. Will 0.75 be enough? It might. And uh, yeah, actually even at the 0.75, uh, it's still yielded, we're not having any problems. So even at 0.75, uh, we will be fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that. And uh, what I next wanna do is, so I've calculated the amount of steel I need in a one foot section of beam. However, I still need to actually, so that is a, uh, notice I haven't actually done, done anything with bar sizes. All I've done is figure out, okay, well, this is how much steel on average each one foot section needs to have. If I'm actually laying, if I'm actually designing a real slab though, what I need to do is I need to take that AS value and turn it into both a slab or a steel uh, bar size and spacing. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I want to, before I select a bar size, I would like to look at uh, my uh, max spacing. And this is ACI 24.4.3.3. So let's go there. Twenty-four point four point three point three. Now we want to find the maximum spacing. And twenty-four point four point three point three, if we read this carefully. That doesn't actually apply to our case here. That deals with shrinkage and uh, uh, temperature reinforcement. Rather, what applies is um, right, right here. Maximum spaces of spacing a bond of reinforcement and not in pre stress, in non pre stress, and class C pre stress one way slabs and beams. So, uh, for, we, we will need to use this 24.4.3.3 for uh, the temperature space, temperature seal, and the temperature and shrinkage seal, or crack control seal, and the way of looking at that, but that won't apply for our primary flexural reinforcement. Instead, what's going to apply is this here. Uh, table 24.3.2. And it is the lesser of 15 over 40,000 times Fs. Uh, now, what is Fs? Well, we can go to our handy dandy uh, chart at the beginning or table at the beginning of the book. And FS is tensile uh, stress in reinforcement. So it's the, the actual stress in reinforcement at service load. And so it's the actual uh, stress in reinforcement at service load, uh, excluding pre stress reinforcement. Now, since we've confirmed that our uh, steel is going to yield, uh, we won't need to necessarily worry about that. Our Fs will just be equal to Fy. And our uh, C sub C is our clear cover. And as you saw previously, and that, that's the clear cover on the tension base of the slab. And we assumed that our clear cover was, let's see, what did we assume here? Remember, we assumed a clear cover, which is the, again, the distance from the uh, outer face of the slab to here. Uh, of one and a quarter inches. Although um, here, we did say that this would change depending on what our bar size was. Uh, so we, we basically fixed the depth, we fixed the depth V while varying the clear cover. So uh, to be, so I wanna find some value that we could be conservative with. And well, if we look at the equation here, uh, the maximum spacing is going to be, uh, 
So we can't just ignore the clear cover because that's going to um, be uh, greater that subtraction, the more uh, critical that will be. So uh, what our cover requirement, I guess that we can just use the minimum cover for that. So having extra cover shouldn't necessarily hurt us. So our, our, we assumed a clear cover one of, of one and a half inches. Let's go ahead and use that. Uh, C sub C equals 1.5 inches. Although in reality, it may be a bit larger. And let's see. So, although I suppose we could just assume the largest value, just like we did before, if we have a, uh, if our depth is, let's see, if our beam depth, if we're assuming one and three quarter, again, for a bar diameter, even though it's not really possible, um, that would mean our, let's see, we have a beam depth of our beam depth here, we assumed, was 6.75 inches, plus that, uh, plus that, where was that, that one and three quarter. So 6.75 plus uh, 1.75, uh, 6.75 plus 1.75, 1 and 3 quarter, that will be 8.5 inches. And, oh wait, that can't be right. That would have a depth of 8.5 inches. Okay, again, we assumed up here a clear cover of, uh, of 1 and a half inches, so we can just go ahead and use that for our C sub C. And again, that was uh, used along with the depth that uh, correspond to a large, the largest bar size uh, that we might reasonably use. So I don't think we can have any problem with that. So C sub C is uh, 1.5 inches. Now we do need to look at FS. And the critical thing about FS is that it is not the yield stress. It is the working stress and at, at, with, at service load. And this calculating this could be very tricky if you're doing, if you have to do a lot of iterations. But thankfully, ACI gives you a nice quick shortcut that says you can take FS as simply two thirds of SY. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, so this is the tension working stress, which is FS equals two thirds of SY. And that comes to, uh, that will for, for a, uh, 60 psi steel that will come to 40 psi. So then we go here and find, we go back to our table, 24.3.2, and calculate these two conditions, these two uh, states. And so we want the lesser of 15 times 40,000. And this is going to be, we do, these, this is the spacing, it's going to be in inches. 40,000 divided by, and that would be uh, 40,000. Uh, or just, oh yeah, 40,000 uh, divided by 40 KSI. Uh, maybe I can say FS, but I want to divide by KSI to cancel out the unit there. And minus 2.5 times C sub C. And oh, that doesn't sound right. Oh, we got some sort of unit error, error there. Um, oh, I see issue. Well, if we're gonna, this is clearly written for PS for K, for PSI, so we could also just say this is four thousand uh, PSI, or we could just uh, put in a. Maybe I'll make this a little bit simpler and just modify this to units. SMS can be tricky with units sometimes. That would just be forty PSI. That in meters or eleven point two five inches. So the maximum bar spacing with this limit, based on this limit, is. Uh, 11.25 inches, and then we need to consider the other one. 12 times 40, uh, 40 KSI divided by F sub S. And that will come to 12, oh, and that is in inches. That's in meters, which is not what I want, but in inches, that is 12 inches. So the lesser of these two, so our therefore our max our, our minimum spacing uh, minimum allowable spacing is eleven point two five inches. 
So, let's see here. So basically now, uh, we need to find a spacing and a bar size. Uh, a spacing that is le somewhere less than 11.25 inches and a bar size, some sort of bar size, that will produce an average of 0 0.75 uh, or greater uh, square inches of steel per foot. So, let's see here. Well, so we need to assume a bar size. So uh, let's let's just uh, let's fiddle with a few bar sizes and see where that gets us. So let's uh, try various spacings and bar sizes. And you wouldn't have to go through this step if you were analyzing a beam, in fact, or, or analyzing a slab. In fact, this would be a lot quicker. But uh, because we're designing it, we have to sort of fiddle with the bar sizes and spacing a bit. Um, but there's no necessarily right answer to this, just what, we want, what we're comfortable with. Uh, try various spaces and bar sizes to produce an average steel area per unit width of uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.75 inches squared, which I believe is what we had previously. Again, area of steel, yep, was 0.75 inches squared. And we can't go under this, but we can go over this. So one thing we could do is, well, 11.25 inches, well, what if we use a little bit higher, or a little bit smaller than that? Again, we can't fill, this, that is our, uh, oh, actually, I should say, I shouldn't label that minimum, I should label that maximum. Maximum RL spacing, not minimum, do not confuse the two. And then, so let's go ahead and say, oh, what's a nice round number? Maybe I can just say the spacing is 10 inches. And that will be the center to center distance of two uh, bars of two flexural reinforcement. Again, not referring to our um, our temperature and shrinkage steel, but our primary reinforcing steel. Spacing of 10 inches. So if we want to find the bar spacing, we can set up a relationship uh, that basically calculates steel per foot. So the area of each individual bar divided by the spacing is going to be equal, is going to have the same average steel area per foot of beam or per inch. So we can set this as a S over 12 inches. Or another way we can say this is that the area of the bar required is going to be equal to the area of steel that we calculated divided by 12 inches and this times the spacing. So the area of the bar that we need uh, it, with a spacing of 10 inches is going to be equal to AS times uh, the spacing divided by our nominal uh, or our unit beam width of 12 inches. Oh, and uh, oh, I should give, it, give that a label of S. Oh. Let's just start over on that. S equals uh, 10 inches. And so our area bar, again, this is the area of an individual bar, not the, okay, so if you're having trouble distinguishing AS from AB, AB is going to be the area of an individual bar, while AS is the average steel per unit width of our ideal idealized beam. So this means the area of our bar must be, uh, with a, again, with a spacing of 10 inches, must be S, must be greater than that many square uh, meters, or that many inches squared. Oh, that's a file. Don't make typos here. 4.65 uh, square inches, or converting that to a diameter, minimum bar diameter, only at a spacing of 10 inches. B then, okay, so I know A is equal to pi r squared over 4, or sorry, pi B squared over 4. Again, if, uh, let's see, if A equals pi times B squared over 4, this is just doing some quick algebra. All that over 4, then therefore diameter is going to be equal to A, the area of a bar, times 4 divided by pi 
and all of that that you just and the square root of all that. And that comes to that many uh, meters or in inches, 0.89 inches. Or it looks like that is a uh, 0.89 inches. Or uh, if we look at a bar size in eighths, that would be a, well, let's see, what is seven eighths? For a number seven bar do, so seven over eight inches is. is 0.875, so that's not going to be enough. So I don't. I generally like to avoid using very large bar sizes on slabs just for constructability purposes. So what I would rather do is I'd almost rather use a smaller spacing. So let's try using a spacing, oh, I don't know, like maybe 8 inches. So number 7 bar would work in that case, or we could even do a 6 inches. Spacing of 6 inches. And then we'd be able to get away with a, and we'd probably be able to get away with a number six bar. Yeah, we would. So if we do this, we can say, okay, let's uh, let's use uh, number six bars, a uh, space that's six inches for our primary flexural reinforcement. And those of you who know slab design or uh, have some experience with slab design. They recognize that this is a bit of an unreasonable case. Like you don't, this is a lot of steel, or relatively large bar sizes for um, uh, most reinforced concrete slabs. But I think that ultimately comes down to the load. Um, the span and loads are relatively large to not have any um, interstitial beams. Typically, uh, for something like this, you'd have beams closer together, uh, or more, or we can we can, we would be able to use less steel if we were using a, a continuous slab rather than a simply supported slab. So there's that. So we have we now have to have a design for our primary flexural reinforcement. Now we just need to figure out the, uh, the steel for our shrinkage and temperature effects. Actually, might make this its own section. Or do something not calculate, maybe design. Shrinkage and temperature reinforcement. Design shrinkage and temperature reinforcement. So what we want to say is uh, we want to go to we want to first look at the uh, minimum we want to look at the minimum uh, shrinkage and temperature reinforcement area and also the uh, maximum spacing. I can manage to spell the word shrinkage correct. And this is area per unit width. And again, this is ACI 24.4.3.2. Uh, Let's go there. So the ratio of deformed shrinkage and temperature reinforcement area to gross concrete area shall be greater than or equal to 0 0.0018. And if you're ever wondering uh, where the term deformed comes from, that of course is, re that is referring to uh, the uh, deformed bars refer to bars that have a, have uh, that aren't smooth. In other words, they are, they are deformed in, into kind of, into the uh, standard pattern that you see in most rebar. Uh, in real, in the real olden days, the early days of reinforced concrete, think like 1920s, 1930s, sometimes then you'd see smooth bars, but since then, we've pretty much moved to a, a standard of deformed bars pretty much for everything. So you have uh, bars that have a sort of a shape like this with regularly spaced ridges, and those help provide a grip. Those help to bond the, the rebar to the, to the concrete, ensuring uh, adequate, uh, adequate uh, let's say, composite action. So. Um, the ratio of our temperature and shrinkage steel to the gross area must be 0 0.0018. And the gross area is going to be equal to the beam width, in this case, the section of our slab, uh, times the beam depth. So uh, gross area. That's EG. 
equals the beam width times depth, which is that many in meters squared, or in freedom units, 81 square inches. And therefore, our minimum shrinkage and temperature scale per unit at width um, is going to be 0.0018 times kg. And that's that lovely number in uh, meters squared or in freedom units, inches squared, is going to be 0 uh, 14, uh, 0 0.146 inches squared. So we only need 0.146 inches squared per foot of beam. So we can see here that, requ that, we, that the requirements for shrinkage and temperature reinforcement are very minor. Um, you don't need very much. All you're trying to do is resist cracking, uh, or at least contain cracking, uh, keep it from propagating too far uh, when the concrete undergoes shrinkage. And in fact, this is why if you ever see someone pour a sidewalk, they don't typically use very large bar sizes. In fact, it's not uncommon for sidewalks uh, just to use small like wire mesh and things like that, because those just simple wire mesh often can meet that minimum area requirement. Oh, and the, the load requirements are so small that the shrinkage is really what dominates. The shrinkage scale is really the controlling factor for something as small or something that's carrying as small loads as a common residential sidewalk. Okay. And then we do need the maximum spacing. And that again is found in ACI. Uh, ACI 24.4.3.3. And looking here. Uh, so uh, deformed shrinkage and temperature reinforcement shall be uh, not exceed the lesser of 5h and 18 inches. So 5 times h is that lovely in meters, or 18 inches. So 18 inches controls. So the maximum spacing is going to be 18 inches. So uh, we could just so I, for lack of anything else, we could well we could do different things. If, so we're going to have to play the same game of trying to figure out the spacing here. Let's say we have a spacing equal to uh, 18 inches. What kind of bar size will we need? Well, again, the area of the bar is, uh, let's see, going to be equal to the area of steel. And we need this area of steel to be uh, greater than or equal to this. I'll go ahead and say my area of steel. And again, this is the area of steel for just the uh, temperature and shrinkage steel. It's going to be A sub X equals that. Like that. Like that. Again, A sub S is the steel per unit uh, width of the beam. Well, AB, what I'm labeling here, what I'm labeling AB here, would be the actual diameter of a single bar. Uh, so AB times the spacing divided by uh, 12 inches. That many meters squared or inches squared. Oh, that just went out right. And then the bar diameter, the required bar diameter then is just this. So that would also be, so that would be relatively large bar size. That would be um, like something that doesn't look right. Oh, uh, this means 18 inches. Well, I guess our area of bar, uh, our area of steel required was relatively small here, probably because of our large uh, beam depth. So number of six bars, I'm not going to use that one, but uh, I don't necessarily want to use the number six bars for the minor steel as well. So maybe instead what we could do is use a smaller spacing. We can go ahead, we can always use a smaller spacing, we just can't use a, uh, a spacing greater than 18 inches. So let's try 12 inches. Oh, something's, if it is not adjusting, oh, I need to actually... Oh, and okay, I, I wondered why that was the same number. Well, it turns out I didn't have this defined properly. So 
so 18 inches and even this is still relative is still a relatively large bar size so what happens if i knock this down to 12 inches in that case the, the bar size requirement required is 0.43 and that would cover in eighths if i multiply that by eighth i can get a bar size uh, uh, and divide by inches maybe so a number four bar would work because that would be four eighths yeah so i think we could just use a number four bar or uh minor steel use a number four bar use number four bars space at uh, 12 inches inches on center. And if I want, I can go ahead and uh, sketch this out. If I were to sketch this out, using only the highest uh, high-tech graphing software here. So I'm going to have my uh, major steel. So my major steel will be uh, in this design will be uh, that's going to be number six bars. For our main steel and the spacing here will be six inches and we won't have to worry about any spacing requirement uh, max, we don't have to worry about any uh let's say minimum spacing requirement for this because six inches you're not gonna have any problems with uh concrete flowing that kind of thing so then for our for concrete flowing around bars that sort of thing that is a relatively large spacing at least for it would be for a beam at least and then in the minor direction again the minor direction just has steel uh, for shrinkage and uh, creep rather than or for shrinkage creep and temperature effects rather than for uh, major flexible reinforcement and this dimension would be 12 inches and we would have a number four bar and then uh, number four bars Not Mars bars. Oh, hi typo. So we have our X. Maybe I can just point to it, add a little pointer to those, and the larger bars there. And this is our final, and in case it's not clear, our overall slab, our overall uh, length of our slab, that L, is in this direction. All of the load, all of the structural loads are carried along this one direction, and so the number six bars, the primary flexural reinforcement, will go in that direction. And again, we calculated a length of uh, 15 feet, although not all the bars are shown here. Obviously, this is not the scale. L equals 15 feet. And that should do it. So I can go ahead and plop this in as a final design. And uh, note, this is the general process for, uh, oh, did I not have that right now? I have something. Make the dimension there. And that will be our final design. Oh, and I should probably also, actually let me put one other thing on here. Would also be good to note the slab thickness. Maybe something like this. Something to indicate indicate that we're applying to an area, and then uh, slab thickness, not the depth, the thickness, the h. That slab thickness we are using not the minimum value, but we're using. We assumed. Uh, well, actually, we did assume the, the minimum value. We assumed the minimum value of nine inches, which is. 
not completely unreasonable, but a decently thick concrete slab. And I will go ahead and pop paste this into this uh, drawing or into this calculation sheet. Now, again, this is the general process for uh, designing a simply supported uh, one-way concrete slab, reinforced concrete slab. Uh, let's review the process. The general process is we uh, first calculate our loads. Uh, then we want to calculate, determine our minimum thickness, and use that as a starting point for iterating along the line. Then we work through our moment cap. We check our shear calculations just to make sure our uh, just to make sure our shear capacity is fine based only on concrete strength rather than having to use any um, uh, shear stirrups, because you can't really use shear stirrups in a reinforced concrete slab. There's just not enough room for them, unlike beams. And uh, if we didn't have that shear capacity, we would go and, uh, if we didn't have the adequate shear capacity, we would just make the slab thicker. Then going along, we go ahead and calculate the moment capacity, uh, the design moment capacity like we did before with reinforced concrete beams, and we're looking at those. Uh, we calculate our clear cover, we find our maximum spacings, uh, for both the uh, for the primary flexural reinforcement, and we find the area of steel required and the area of the bar each individual bar required uh, for an assumed spacing, and we just work through a uh, spacing and a we just work through some combinations of bar sizes and spacing until we get something that seems reasonable. And then for shrinkage and temperature, we 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 find the maximum spacing for shrinkage and temperature reinforcement, and we find the required area. And then again, we just uh, iterate uh, to find a given spacing and bar size that will meet both those requirements. All right, so that is the general process of designing reinforced concrete uh, slabs, in particular, the process of designing one-way slabs in the case of a simply supported slab. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below or to email me. I will see you all again in the next lecture where we look at the, uh, we'll be looking at the similar, a very similar problem we're looking at the design of reinforced concrete slabs uh, that are continuous uh, rather than uh, simply supported. We'll still be looking at one-way slabs. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If not, like, comment, and subscribe to Baker Robot Copy. Regardless, I hope to see you all soon in the next lecture. I'll see you all then, and as always, thank you.